Hello, everybody. Welcome to OpenCV Weekly Webinar. And today I have with me Jeff Powers, who is uh, the founder of uh, a very well-known company you must know, Occipital. And right now he is uh, leading an AR VR company. And the name of it is, uh, it's a bit tricky. I will let you, Jeff, uh, pronounce it. But before that, I also want to uh, mention that Phil Nelson is also with us. He's the content manager at OpenCV. And as always, he will uh, lead the, um, um, uh, he, he, he organizes the webinar uh, for us. And um, welcome, Phil. Hey, folks. As a reminder, we'll be doing Q&A like usual. Please use the Zoom Q&A functionality to ask your question at any point during the webinar, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end. There will also be a trivia question for uh, a giveaway of a free license for OpenCV courses. Um, yeah. So uh, welcome, Jeff. Uh, I would like you to introduce yourself. Uh, you have several companies under your belt already. Yeah. And um, also, uh, you know, if you could explain the, uh, the name of yeah. your current company. Yeah, absolutely. So my, uh, my current company is Arcturus Industries. And uh, there's kind of a long history of why it's called Arcturus. It has to do with a secret project naming scheme that we had at Occipital um, years ago. But also it's uh, kind of our thought is Arcturus is actually one of the brightest stars in the night sky. It's one of the closest stars. And the idea is that our computer vision tech is the best in the Milky Way galaxy, whether or not you're orbiting the sun or Arcturus. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, the talk is divided into two parts, right? One is all the AR VR stuff you're doing at Arcturus. And, and I thought that it was related to AR VR, but it is not. Uh, okay. And, uh, and the first, but in the first part, we will go over stories from your first company, Red Blazer, where you built uh, an app for iPhone a barcode scan scanning app for iPhone and all the uh, all the very interesting stories from that uh, venture. And then we will uh, come to Arcturus and figure out, you know, what you're doing with in the AR VR space, view synthesis, et cetera. And so, eagle-eyed yeah. viewers may remember uh, Red Laser from the Cos Reddy's webinar episode. Mm -hmm. uh, great. So should I go ahead and get started? Yes. Yes, please. All right. Here we go. So... Uh, yeah, it's great to, great to be here. This is fun. This is like one of the longest talks that I've given in a while. So it kind of had to dust off my speech skills. Um, bear with me if they're not any good anymore, but, um, at Arcturus, we're working on 3d perception for AR VR. Uh, Arcturus does start with AR, uh, even though, uh, it's not exactly before AR, but it's, but we do work on AR VR and our, uh, initials are AI, and we kind of do use AI too. So uh, that's a little bit of our Arcturus, but I'm excited to tell you guys some stories from 2009, 2010 about uh, Red Laser, which was the kind of the, the precursor to all the stuff we did at Occipital. Um, so, uh, but we will be talking about uh, the tech we're doing at Arcturus, which is SLAM, view synthesis, and controller tracking. Before that, though, a little bit about the team. Uh, my team now is, is a 15 person team. I kind of like smaller teams these days and my, my dream team size is like 15 to 20, you know, well knit team, which all has like a Vulcan mind meld and you can solve really big problems together. I kind of find that the perfect size. We're based in the U S and Spain. Actually, one of our lead engineers was actually from, uh, living in Madrid and we decided this is an amazing city relatively untapped from a computer vision perspective, let's make that our home base. And so we actually have a team in, uh, in Spain and then some people in the US and a couple of people dotted around. Uh, one cool thing about our, our company is we are actually really closely partnered with Valve. So if you've ever heard of, you know, Valve, you've probably heard of Valve, you've heard, probably heard of Steam, you've probably heard of Half-Life, Portal, uh, uh, you know, they just announced something called Steam Deck. Uh, so this is a company that I've known and followed since I was a kid, and it's really exciting to be able to work with them on the intersection of computer vision and VR. So that's a little bit about us, um, but we'll get back to that. 
Um, but for now, I'll start out with uh, some stories of red laser and feel free to interrupt me with questions, um, Phil or Satya, as we go. But red laser was founded in 2009. It was, um, it was not our first idea. It was kind of our fallback idea after we failed to get interest in things closer to augmented reality back then. Just not a lot of investors were interested in that or people just didn't think that people were gonna be carrying their phones around and doing this kind of stuff all the time. Of course, in retrospect, they did, but um, we fell back to something a little bit more simple, which was barcode recognition on the iPhone. And the iPhone at the time didn't have an autofocus camera. So if you tried to take a picture of a barcode, it was incredibly blurry. You couldn't even read it um, as a human. So, you know, the question was, could we actually get our, our phone to do it? In the end, we did. Uh, kind of at the pinnacle, we were even featured in this Apple TV ad. I'll show you a few seconds of it. And then I did a quick check to see if it was cheaper anywhere else. Uh -huh. Turned out the best price was around the corner. I'm a much smarter and faster shopper with my iPhone. The, um, the local result that you saw there uh, may or may not have been something that we added to the database to make the Apple TV ad look better. <laughs> <laughs> it still technically came from the app, you know. <laughs> it did come from uh, the app. It's not, it's not cheating if you're not lying, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so a few stories. First is we built Red Laser in a basement. Uh, actually, we built Red Laser and its precursors in a series of basements <laughs> um, in Boulder. So really, we got to Boulder to join the Techstars program. We were in a basement office with Techstars. We moved into a basement of an, uh, a deli, a former deli. And then we moved into the office. You can see me in here, uh, which was in the Cartwright building it's called, but it was, it was a pretty lame office. Um, we shared it with another company, another Techstars company. And that's where we basically built Red Laser. Um, but what's funny is that office was actually nice compared to where we had been before. Um, when Vikas and I were very first starting out working on ideas, we were in New York City. We had these two terrible offices, uh, especially the Columbia office near Columbia University. It was a sixth floor walk up. And we actually at one point brought a huge server up our sixth floor walk up, uh, which was a horrible mistake because when we turned the server on, if you've ever used like big desktop servers, they, at least they historically had huge fans. And so this thing was like, sounded like an air conditioning unit. Uh, needless to say, we basically never used that server. And I'm sure now that server would be probably less powerful than an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing about Red Laser is it didn't work the way most people thought it worked. So whenever we talked to people, and lots of times we didn't correct people when they talked to us, but they would say, oh man, you guys have figured out how to deconvolve the image and then you were and then you were uh you know you were then just running a regular barcode scanner on it yeah um, how are you doing all that on the phone yeah. we were just like yeah aren't we cool <laughs> and uh, right. uh what we actually did though was arguably simpler arguably a more sophisticated um which was really we were just doing an accelerated blur and compare kind of that sort of simplify it um what we did is we we, we took these, these images in real time. I'll tell you how we got the images in the first place because the Apple didn't have a camera API for, for video. Mm -hmm. But we, we took these images and we, we figured out where we thought the barcode was. And then we, um, and, and I'll show you that. Um, the way we did that was we, we, took, an, we took an image and we, we took, even though these were blurry, if the region of the image that you're looking at contains a barcode, it's likely to be very similar vertically. So as you traverse up and down the image vertically, you'll see the same thing. Um, and so we had a simple filter that basically did that. These days you just train a neural net to do it and the neural net would figure that out. Um, but in, we didn't have neural nets really at the time, like they weren't popular. So we were basically, uh, we have this manual filter of looking if the image was similar vertically. If it was, we would have a higher score. If it wasn't, we'd have a lower score. Found the region that had the highest score. That's our barcode. Um, but then what is the barcode? And what we would do is we would chunk that region into segments where we thought each digit would be. 
And then we would iterate through uh, possible digits. We would, iter we would uh, optimize for lighting. So if the image was really bright, we would have an, sort of an offset and scale for that. If it was dark, we would have a different offset and scale. Um, and then whether the barcode was tilted in plane, so it was tilted towards you or away from you, sort of on the left and right side. And so we had these parameters that we could that we could iterate, and we basically just had this big simulate, compare, iterate, simulate, compare, iterate, simulate, compare, iterate, and that's how it worked. And in the end, whatever the optimal uh, fit was, it would synthetically recreate this barcode. Whatever the optimal synthetic result was that close, most closely matched the real was what we thought the barcode was. Right. And this was all before, you know, uh, deep learning was there, computational power was limited, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, you could not do this on the phone back then. Uh, so uh, it's it's quite uh, quite interesting, right? The way you solved it. Uh, why didn't you do deconvolution? I mean, uh, there were papers around at that time for blind deconvolution. I was just curious. Yeah. We tried a little bit. We, yeah. I won't say we were experts in it, and I'm sure what's out there today would totally solve this problem. But mm -hmm. especially if you, like, if you had like a trained deconvolution that was using, you know, barcode data as its input. Yeah. But we tried, and it, it just basically made these things sharper. But it made a lot of errors. It, it, you know, it, you couldn't run, uh, at least on the things we could find without doing a lot of our own research. You yeah. could not yeah. run a, a traditional barcode decoder on the outputs; it just wouldn't work. Got it. Got it. And also, if I recall, some of them are pretty slow. So what we did is actually faster than mm -hmm. that approach. Oh yeah, deconvolution is slow. And some of these things, you know, um, uh, some there are there are these ideas. Like I like to say that for every diff difficult problem, there is a simple, easy to understand wrong solution, right? Uh, so unless you have actually tried it, you don't know the complexity of the problem. You would think that some other uh, solution is the obvious one, but mm -hmm. that's not always the case. You have to get your hands dirty into some of these problems to understand the complexity, to understand the nuances of the problem, right? So while deconvolution looks like an obvious thing to do, uh, in your case, you might, might have just found it simpler to, the, to do the way you did it, right? Instead yeah. of struggling with uh, these uh, deconvolution al algorithms. Yeah, it might have taken us years to make deconvolution work. Um, right. We got it in months. So um, so uh, I showed you the barcode detector. Another another story about red laser is that I still remember uh, talking to Vikas about it. And uh, up until maybe one or two days before launch, we actually were going to make the app completely free. And uh, we basically, the idea was we were going to generate uh, leads for our SDK. And that's where we were going to make money. And uh, at the last minute, we were said, why don't, why don't, let's charge for it. Like, it's easier to make it free later. We charge for it now. Um, and maybe, like, we'll get better signal from our users whether or not they're interested in this app mm -hmm. and whether or not it's working for them. If they're actually paying for it, they're, you know, they're, they're going to give us better feedback. So we, um, so we did that. And it ended up, in the end, that we, we made 10 times more uh, more or less 10 times more on just selling the app than we did on the SDK. <laughs> um, yeah, Vikas, uh, Vikas Reddy, who is your co-founder, he was on this uh, webinar also, as you as you know. Yeah. And he had mentioned that, you know, uh, he didn't mention the exact numbers, but somewhere uh, at its peak, uh, you guys were making thirty to $40,000 a day yeah. uh, selling this app, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a slide uh, that I've, I actually do show you some, a little brief snippet of, of sales per day. Um, but, uh, I think that's in like two slides, but yeah, it was, it was not that way initially. Initially it was, was a flop, but we did eventually get up to, you know, many tens of thousands per day and, and had pretty strong staying power on the app store, staying near the top for a long time. So for a large part of the end of 2019 and 2020, uh, we were, I think in the top five or so of the app store. Did you did you mean two, 2009 and 2010? Sorry, like yeah, I did. Right. Okay, yeah, 2009. Yeah, so long ago now. Yeah, 2009 and 2010. Yeah, it's, um, been, a, it's been a long decade for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the first version was a flop, and and I'll show you this video, and you'll you'll be able to tell why I think. Today we're going to show you Red Laser, the first accurate barcode scanning application for the iPhone. 
We're in Target right now, so let's scan a product. So you take a photo, you have to take it from pretty far back so that we get the image as, as in focus as we could. Yeah. Zoom in, we use this slow Apple camera API to take photos, crop the image out, upload it to our servers. Over an server edge connection. connection. Over an edge. Three, oh, it says 3G there. And then, um, <laughs> And then it uh, and then it would send back the results. So you saw how long that took. Um, I the app generated hundreds of downloads per day, uh, which we actually didn't think was terrible. But that was really all it got to. At some point, I actually came home for a visit, showed it to my grandma, and she just could not use it. Like I was I was trying to give her these instructions. Just the idea of holding the phone back here while the barcode was up there, juggling. Uh, she could not use it. And I, I think a lot of users face that same issue, plus just the delay in time. It just wasn't that, it just wasn't successful. Um, so we ended up being inspired by uh, another app, which was this app called Sudoku Grab. And you, you can't get it anymore, but it was really cool. It was ahead of its time. The app would actually, somehow it was it was doing video processing. We didn't really know how at first, but we realized what they were doing is actually screenshotting the screen. So they would, they would bring up the camera feed as if you were gonna take a picture, but then instead of taking a picture, they would screenshot uh, repeatedly and uh, process the screenshot data. And that gave them a video feed. And, um, but, but if you see here, there's actually stuff rendered on top of the video feed how, how did they do that? What they actually did was, if you look at this zoomed in inset, um, they would render only a, like a pattern of alternating pixels. So they could still sample in between where they were rendering to more or less figure out what the video feed was behind their rendering. Um, and this was, this was all done by a guy, uh, Chris Greening. And uh, it was just a really innovative app. And we saw that and we thought, this is it. We can do video processing. And that led to Red Laser 2.0, um, which was a big jump forward and did video processing in this way using this, this API. And so you can see here, this was running that algorithm I told, told you guys about earlier, where it was basically doing the sort of guess and check on, on the potential barcodes. And then the only thing you had to send to the server was just the barcode string itself. And so it was immediate to get the data up. Um, we also did some smart stuff, like we'd stream you back the name of the product just in text, and you'd see that immediately, and then you'd stream back more data as we got price information. So people remarked about just how fast uh, Red Laser was. Um, yeah, that that first uh, like the, the UX difference is you know like night and day, um, but I noticed it it does that smart thing where right away it shows you some information, right? Also, I noticed you can get closer to the barcode on this one. Yes, you can get way closer. And that was critical because people just did not understand. And we got so many images where people did that basically with the original app where they would just be right up against the barcode. And they just, it's just not intuitive to people to, to stand back to take photos. It's pretty interesting to me to be able to see the, um, this same basic flow really repeated um, structurally through structure sensor and even Vikas's new uh, startup light twist where uh, the idea is you do as much as you can right you know on the phone to get that visceral reaction right away and then send it off to the server for extra processing if you need to it's it's pretty cool to see that through line from this app all the way to today yeah that's true um, yeah people like that instant gratification and you know that it's working. I think that's critical if you want to do computer vision at, at, at very large scales to everyday people. It has to be instant. Um, so interestingly, we worked around an Apple API to do this. We, we were using this, I mean, we sort of were working around it. We sort of weren't. We were using this screen grab uh, feature. And Apple would sometimes approve the app and other times not. Um, other times the reviewers would look at this and say, wait, I don't, I don't think we have like a video processing API. You, this isn't, uh, you guys must be um, using an undocumented API. And then we would email app review and say, oh no, we're not. We're, you know, we're using this, this public API. And, um, and so we ended up spending six months of 2009 
not consecutively, but in chunks for where we were blocked from being approved on the app store. And um, it was very stressful, but we just assumed, you know, we were just like, well, this is the future. People are moving this direction. There's gonna be video processing. Let's keep cranking. So we kept working on the app, even though we were systematically blocked. Finally, Apple did unblock us. I think it was around the time that we had achieved literally almost 10% penetration onto all iPhones. Wow. So Apple kind of had to pay attention. <laughs> right. Um, well, not only and, did they pay attention, they made it part of your ad, <laughs> part of their ad, right? Yeah, they 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 leaned a lot into this. I mean, not just because of us, but we were one of the apps they paid attention to. They made sure they weren't breaking. They actually did contact us for feedback on the API that became AV Foundation, which does real time video uh, capture. And um, but we did have a tough time, and and Vikas was actually asked to write a guest article in Newsweek, which he did, and. December 2009, where we had a few choice words about Apple's restrictive policies, and uh, Apple wasn't very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we worked around Apple's API. Is, is that all? No, we worked around Amazon's API too. Did Apple do anything about it though? I mean, they were not happy in the sense that they sent you an email saying that, please don't yeah, do this again. They were not happy that we wrote that article. Um, right. So they asked us to like maybe say some clarifying words because they had since improved the the situation around the camera APIs. Right. So we did, we wrote a comment on the post saying, well, it's, it's getting better. Right. Um, but um, no, I mean, they had just blocked us for six months of 2009. That, that's what they had done before. Um, but then by this time, we, it was finally, we were finally in the clear for, for doing video processing. Right. But we also faced another issue, which was we really wanted to show Amazon results. And we had, found in Amazon's, we didn't actually sign up for their APIs uh, for price search, but we actually saw in their APIs that it was restricted. You were not allowed to use the APIs on mobile apps, which to us was just this weird, arbitrary, strange restriction. And it didn't even seem real. It didn't even seem right. It was like, why not? Like mobile apps is probably where you're going to get a lot of, you know, commerce. So right. why restrict that? Um, but the word on the street was that this came from Jeff, you know, the Jeff that flew to space two days ago. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were, you know, we were just like, okay. So what we did is we, we had every, we had your individual iPhone, when you used red laser, your iPhone would actually do a search on Amazon, just like you were searching Amazon, just like you go to the search bar on Amazon, you type something in, we would, we would do that same query. We would get back whatever Amazon sent back. And we would send that as HTML to our server. And our server would then parse that. And our server just had a parser that we wrote that was you know, updated to handle whatever the latest version of the Amazon website was. Um, and so it worked. And our, we were thinking, look, a Amazon's probably not even going to know that we're doing this. That we're nobody. Like We're just this little app. They're not going to care. They're not going to know. Um, and if they did, then they can't, what are they going to do about it, right? We're just, people's phones are just searching at Amazon for results. We're not right. actually using the API. So, so that's what we thought. Um, a little more on that later. Um, so then, you know, I showed you the real-time version of the app, which was a huge step forward. But the interesting thing is it still wasn't a, an overnight success. Like it still was, one of the big issues with it was it wasn't fully supporting EAN barcodes. And the other issue, which is sort of the international UPC barcodes. And then it also wasn't, um, it was throwing off a lot of false positives. So you could scan something and maybe 20% of the time, depending on how you were scanning it, you'd get back no results because we decoded the barcode wrong. Um, so what we did was we actually um, implemented a, a crude machine learning approach where we learned ratios for every digit. Some of the digits look similar to other digits. So like, mm. you know, a three in barcode form may look very, very different than a seven, but it may look kind of similar to a six. Mm. And so um, for each digit, there was essentially scores of how likely it was that it would look similar to other digits. And we'd have these ratios of the best to the second best match for a given digit and then we would accept or reject that, that particular decoding 
based on how close it was to its neighbor, to its, best, its second best digit. So there was a three, but we thought maybe it was a five. If the ratio is really close, we would reject it. We would say, we can't accept this barcode. But if the ratio was stronger and the three was, was really popping out as the best fit, we would accept it. Hmm. And so we basically had that and we tuned it using, using data. And that, um, that update where we basically reduced the false positive rate uh, was, this, was the trick to making the app go viral. Wow. Which is crazy. It's like, yeah. we couldn't get press for that update. We got some press for our 2.0 update mm -hmm. because it was a big new real time update. Yeah. 2.2, we got no press because it's like 2.2, who cares? What's better about it? Oh, it's a little bit better. Like right. you, can't, you can't get anybody interested in writing that story. Um, but nevertheless, people started trying it and they said, wow, this is working. And then they would tell their friends and they would tell their friends and they would tell their friends. And it just had like a, you know, an R score or whatever it is that was big enough that it just went viral. And so we went from essentially obscurity to the top of the app store here. It says in, in 10 days. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So the lesson there is especially in computer vision and probably in other fields, like people often conclude that maybe your product, maybe the market wasn't ready for it, or maybe, you know, you didn't, you didn't have the right marketing chops or, um, you know, it's, it's often true that you're not doing something right at a business level, but sometimes you're just not doing something right at a tech level. Technical level. Like, sometimes it's just not working well. Enough. Does it work really, really well? And uh, if it does, you may have a hit, even if you don't necessarily do everything else right, even if you don't have the best, you know, PR strategy and things like that. And we certainly didn't. Like, we had no no PR for 2.2. So at this um, time, how many people were working uh, with the company? It was just you and Vikas Reddy, or are there were yeah, more people? It was just the two of us, because we <laughs> didn't have any revenue to pay anybody. We actually almost ran out of money. Uh, we got a $12,000 loan from my mom to stay alive. We were paying ourselves something like $1,200 a month, which we eventually leveled up to $2,500 a month. Um, yeah, it was just us. We couldn't afford anything else. <laughs> right. That's great. Uh, yeah. So this, this update, uh, within a few days, like 10 days, uh, you shot to the top, like number one on App Store. Yeah. Yeah. We were basically, whether it was 10 or 12 or 15 days or whatever, but we, we eventually made it to, to number one. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it, it's really hard to do that now because just of how much competition there is. But, um, but there are other places where you still have this opportunity to be um, uh, where it's a relatively small, relatively captive audience, places like uh, the, you know, the VR ecosystem now with the, the Quest. I mean, there, yes, there's a lot now. It's probably more than first year or two of the iPhone, but it's still relatively early and right. you can have a chance as a small team to be pretty big. Yeah, I like to say that these, there are these platform plays that comes uh, come, you know, once in a few years, maybe five years or so, where some platform is taking off. And if you catch it in the right moment, uh, you just ride the wave. And in my previous companies, we were just known to not catch any, <laughs> any of them. <laughs> so, you know, I was the founder of the company, so I have to take uh, a lot of extremely relatable, myself. Satya. Extremely relatable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, we, we missed the Facebook app boom. Uh, we did not catch that one. We missed the iPhone uh, app uh, uh, boom. We were there. You know, we were there. We were looking from the sideline, working on the new version of the website, <laughs> right? While these things happen. Yep. And that's when I decided that I'm never going to let that happen again. If there is a, a big, uh, you know, wave I see, I'm going to leave everything. I'm going to catch that wave. I'm also getting all my, uh, you know, friends and family into it. Like yeah. this AI wave, for example, uh, right now, I yep. got my brother to, you know, uh, resign from his job. Oh, wow. Very, <laughs> yeah, very well cushy job. <laughs> I've yeah. been trying to get him uh, uh, to work with me for the last two years. And finally, he joined this year, right? So uh, it's it's like all in now. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, no. I think that's I think that's really smart. And now is the time. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, 
another funny story is, you know, we did make it to the top of, if I recall correctly, we made it to top paid pretty quickly, but there's this other category called top grossing, which was actually making the most number of dollars. And if I recall, we had a lot of struggles with an app called IMT Pain, <laughs> which was, it was just hilarious. We're just like, oh, T-Pain's got us again. Like, it seems like a different world, it doesn't Yeah. It? Uh, and, uh, you know, so T-Pain was always there. And finally, <laughs> we made it to, uh, to top grossing. Oh, sweet. And, and displaced T-Pain at some point. And, but it was funny because even after that happened, we were sort of heading the utilities category. You can see our logo there. But there's T-Pain still causing trouble in the music category. <laughs> um, right. So we had these interesting... Um, struggles with with Apple, but but we also had a really interesting time with Amazon. So, you know, I mentioned that Amazon uh, had this policy supposedly from Jeff Bezos himself that they didn't want uh, people hitting the mobile, the API for mobile apps. And um, so we, we at some point had struck up a conversation with Amazon. We, we kind of stayed off the radar for a while. Eventually we struck up a conversation. We thought, you know, Red Laser succeeding. Let's try to get licensing deals with interesting companies. Let's let's try to do that SDK play that we were doing, that we really were we thought was our ultimate future. So we had gotten in touch with Amazon. We were talking to them about licensing Red Laser. So the idea was they could license Red Laser barcode scanner in their own apps. So we flew out to Seattle to meet with them, and uh, they were, you know, excited to talk with us about licensing, but. All of a sudden, they bring in this guy uh, who is basically like, hey, I forget if he was actually from legal or something. He's sort of like, I'm representing, you know, basically our legal team. And you can't use the Amazon API in the Red Laser app. And we were just like, whoa, like we're out here to talk about licensing. And now you're like, stop using our API. So, so what did we say? We said, oh, we're not using your API. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> contraire, <laughs> um, uh, so they're like, we're going to shut you down. And we're like, well, good luck. Um, you're going to have to shut down all iPhones from querying Amazon. <laughs> um, and then they were sort of like, okay, well then we're going to have to stop you in another way. Um, and so that was very interesting. So definitely a rocky start talking to Amazon, uh, in the end, though, it was kind of hilarious because eBay got interested in the company. Um, we kind of went back to Amazon and said, are, are you guys interested? And their corp dev team got involved, and they were actually interested in acquiring us. And uh, so they, they sent out one of their, their, their guys to basically do a diligence trip with us. And it just so happened that the day he arrived was St. Patrick's Day. And a really funny thing about the history of you know the Red Laser Occipital team is St. Patrick's Day was a holiday for us, <laughs> it's a company holiday. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were like, well, St. Patrick's Day, talking to the corp dev guy, we're like, why don't you meet us at the bar at 7 a.m., right when you get in? <laughs> and so this is actually literally a photo on the left of uh, Connor O'Neill's, which a bar is unfortunately now closed, but um, he actually met us there. And the, one of the first things we did is had him do like an Irish car bomb, and we had a number of drinks and uh he probably thought we were crazy but i think we got him a little bit drunk because i still remember like later in the day when we're doing our diligence stuff we were talking about you know mechanical turk and uh you know at some point he was like oh do you guys get like really inappropriate images uploaded to your mechanical turk stuff and he's like that happens to us all the time at, at amazon like in fact, it got so frequent that we called it the beep of the day. <laughs> oh, I won't tell you exactly what that was, but you can guess. Yes. Um, and so this Russian, this German guy is like, oh, the beep of the day, the beep of the day. So we're like, okay. <laughs> we six, we now, six, now, six. now we are ready to discuss uh, <laughs> con uh, contracting terms or licensing terms. Yeah, let's immediately switch into that. <laughs> um, ultimately, though, uh, we went with eBay and... Um, it was it was fun and it was it was interesting. Like a couple a couple little stories from that. Um, we had just gotten into the we we've been in contact with Apple about doing the um, the Apple TV ad, and 
you know, we really wanted eBay to close the deal. And so we were, we were concerned. I mean, it, took, it takes a while to close these deals. There were, there were questions about, I have a whole, a whole other stories about like IP and their, you know, their legal team was like, oh, th this might be infringing on some patents. And it was this whole thing. And so we were trying to keep them interested. And I, I have this screenshot on the right of iTunes um, with Red Laser in the corner there. And we were, we were doing everything we could to keep eBay excited. I, I think they would have closed the deal anyway, but we didn't know. And so we're out there visiting them and we're like presenting different things on our computer screen. And I still remember like I would have iTunes accidentally up on my screen where I was showing Red Laser like at the top of the app store. Um, <laughs> just as a little subconscious hint that they should right. close the deal. Um, finally, they did close the deal and we had a pretty hefty, like we, we, were, we were a little bit crazy. We were basically like, we can't go work at eBay. Um, we have to do our next thing, which was which was panorama capture, which ended up being pretty successful too. And then ultimately other things like structure sensor. But um, we were like, you're gonna have to, they're like, but we need support. And we're like, okay, pay us a lot for support and we'll, we'll come out and support you guys. Right. And um, and so they, they, they flew us out for a support trip and we got all prepared for the support trip. And in the end, um, more than providing support, we were essentially, I'll say we were essentially professional athletes for a day because they actually, first we spent about an hour or two with you know, discussions and then they took us out to play bocce ball on the clock <laughs> for a few hours. So we were paid right. literally at the level that some A-list professional athletes right. get paid per hour. If we'd been able to continue- Probably way bocce. more than a professional bocce ball player gets paid. Oh, far more. Yeah. We're talking more NBA level. We're talking four or five or six hundred dollars an hour. I forget. Um, That's really nice. And uh, but I still remember like they had dropped this app on on one of their iPhone engineers, and I still remember he was like, "So this was your first iPhone app, huh?" Like after he looked at the code, and he was just like, <laughs> "But but but notice really. the transition." $500 yeah. is what you paid yourself a month, uh, yeah. just, you know, uh, a year or two back. Yeah. And then now we're getting paid that per hour. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but the eBay guys were, uh, awesome. And, um, you know, one of our, one of our, one of our regrets, I think looking back and of course you never know hindsight's 2020, but looking back, we should have, I think we should have joined eBay because, we would have um, we would have made out better financially. It was definitely a factor. Um, we could have put that towards what was next. Um, it probably would have been fun to work with them. And and actually, we learned later on that. Um, well, I'll tell you another story. But we learned later on that Tony Zhu, who actually went on to found DoorDash, was actually uh, dropped in to basically lead business development for Red Lake. So, too bad. Maybe we would have had some some sweet early uh, angel investment shares in DoorDash, which recently <laughs> IPO, um, if we had actually gone to work at, at eBay. So, so a lesson that I have there is, you know, for an early founder, if you have an acquisition opportunity and uh, if, it's, if it's bigger, if you actually join the company versus just sell the product, which usually everybody wants you to join, um, uh, if you're early in your career, take it. Don't, you know, let your ego go a little bit. You're not going to be able to achieve change the world in a year or two. I mean, maybe you can, but most of the time you're going to be better off uh, going to the big company, working there for a few years, see how it goes, and then do your next thing. Um, and then one last little bonus story. Um, after the deal had closed, uh, but before we had announced it, one of our competitors had somehow gotten wind of the fact that we you know, were closing this deal. And he didn't reach out to us himself, but we actually got an outreach from a venture capitalist who had expressed interest in Red Laser. And, you know, he seemed somewhat legit. We looked at his, his portfolio, though, and we saw that he was uh, an investor in our competitor. And so we were a little bit surprised by that, but that he was asking, you know, that he was interested in us. And so he you know, he got us on the phone and he basically started asking us like, hey, word on the street is that you guys are, might be getting acquired. Is that true? And so I told him, I was like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, so I basically lied to him. Um, 
And I was like, I, I think he's like trying to feed this information back to our competitor. And uh, I wasn't sure though. Right. But then about a month later after the deal had closed, our, our competitor actually straight up emailed us and he was like, hey, so how much was the deal? What did it close for? I'm trying to close a similar deal. I need to know comparables here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we didn't tell him. We were just like, really? We're not going to tell you. And, uh, and then he was like, never lie to VCs. They have very long memories. <laughs> 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 Talk about, you know, in the pantheon of a passive aggressive threats. <laughs> that uh, was so, awesome. Yeah. And there's so many other stories that we don't have time for. Uh, around Martha Stewart, we used Mechanical Turk in some super interesting ways. Um, it was a crazy ride considering it was only about, you know, a year and change. So. That's um, great. Yeah, so yeah, pausing there for anything on Red Laser. Otherwise, I'll I want to talk about what Arcturus is up to. Yeah, let's let's hear about the new stuff. Cool. So, at Arcturus, um, we are basically working on a new generation of spatial perception you know, for VR and AR devices. Pretty much, that's going to be headsets. It could also be maybe things you carry around that are spatially aware. But these things need, uh, they need SLAM, which you know, I, I assume a lot of the OpenCV audience will know about SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, figuring out where you are just from looking out from a camera. Um, we need controller tracking because you need input. It's not just about where you are. It's also about where your controllers or maybe hands are. We've chosen to focus on controller tracking at first. Um, and then we also do some stuff in view synthesis, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But... Um, so jumping right in with view synthesis first, um, if you've used a VR headset like the Oculus Quest or the, or the uh, Valve Index or the HP Reverb, you, you'll know that the cameras on the headset are not where your eyes are. But if you wanted to do perfect video pass through, you literally want cameras exactly where your eyes are, right? You can't do that because you can't put cameras in your eyes. Um, and, uh, and further on a lot of the headsets, they choose to separate the cameras even wider than the human interpupillary distance. And so the cameras might be 100 millimeters apart and your eyes are 65. Um, and this causes things to feel wrong. It'll cause you to trip over things if, you're, if that pass-through is just rendered straight to your eyes. Um, if there's VR content rendered on top of, you know, if you fuse together the the real world and the like the VR content you're seeing, and you fuse them without correcting for that, it won't move correctly. So it's just, it's very disorienting. And so that's what our view synthesis tech uh, sets out to solve. Um, it's also funny, the very first uh, algorithm that I implemented as a grad student for my own, you know, I just wanted to try out um, uh, things was a view synthesis uh, paper by Steven Sides. And I just wanted to do it for, for the fun of it, right? I just wanted to see whether this thing actually works or not. So it brings back uh, very good memories. <laughs> My phone, so I'm gonna ignore that. So um, to go into this a little bit, um, um, on the left, you, if you look at this chair, it's a little bit distorted. And that's kind of like, this is a video actually, this is a quick click from Oculus on uh, their view synthesis technology, which they call Pass Through Plus, and um, and I'll just play a few seconds here of this clip. But they they compute a mesh and they use that mesh uh, to essentially correct the appearance of the of the of the room as viewed from from your left and right eyes. Um, and we do the same thing with with our technology, which has now been launched um, uh, last year with the Valve Index as Room View 3D. Um, so a little bit, you know, a little bit for the tech audience, how does this work? So at first we have these stereo inputs. We don't have LIDAR data. We don't have, we don't have active depth. We don't have time of flight. We just have stereo cameras. Um, so the first thing we do is we, we do stereo block matching, basically identical to OpenCV stereo block matching. Um, in fact, I think we may even be calling it OpenCV stereo block matching currently. But then we do something pretty interesting is we actually run a bilateral filter on that, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but that allows us to basically densify the depth in a smart way. We turn that into a mesh, 
we actually do a time warp. Um, one of the cooler things is because we have this ephemeral model, this mesh of the world in front of you, um, if we know how you're moving uh, into the future or ahead of the last camera frame that we had, um, we can actually change your viewpoint, make you, you know, synthetically have you render a view from a slightly different position than where your last camera frame was from. And we take, we, we make heavy use of that because the, the pipeline of getting camera frames captured into a VR rendering system, rendering them, getting them to your, to your retinas is pretty long. It can be, you know, 60 to 100 milliseconds. Um, that's a long latency, but with the IMU, we can extrapolate your motion with maybe two millisecond latency. Wow. Um, and we can, you know, and, and there's still a rendering latency of maybe call it 20 milliseconds or something, but we can basically predict where your eyes are going to be exactly when this rendered content goes on screen. And we can, we can time warp you into the future. Um, so we're literally time warping the cameras uh, into the future, projecting the camera feed from a few, you know, from a certain number of milliseconds to go onto that reprojected world and then re rendering it into your eyes. So for things in the scene that are actually, um, that are static, this is, it's not exactly perfect. It's close to perfect though. It's, it's great. And for things that happening. are dynamic, it's not as accurate. Th this is happening, uh, you know, about uh, 50 uh, frames a second or? Uh... Yeah, so the stereo part is probably happening around 30 to 50 frames per second. The bilateral part is probably similar. The time warp is happening at uh, 90 or 120 frames per second. So, so the overall system is still uh, still real time, uh, 30 frames a second. The camera feed is uh, well on the on the valve index is 54 frames per second from the camera, mm -hmm. and then but the ultimate rendered output, which is smooth smooth and and you know every frame is different mm -hmm. based on that time warp, yeah. uh, is rendered at 100 and usually 90 to 120 or even up to 144 on, on the index hertz. Um, interesting, wow, okay. Yeah, um, and, and a little about the bilateral filter. Um, there's a lot of details in how we make this fast, but um, the basic idea is, uh, and you can use bi bilateral filters are very cool and you can use them for a lot of different things for making, you know, art, you know doing artistic images. You can do it for um, cleaning up like essentially doing uh, edge aware uh, image sharpening. Um, but you have an input image, which is, uh, it's an intensity or an RGB image. And the basic idea is we have some depth information that we get from the traditional block matching. And we want to pair it up so that uh, areas in the image that have a similar color will have a similar depth. And we'll have that depth propagate out until you hit an edge essentially, and then stop propagating. And that allows us to basically fill in all the holes. Um, for example, if we have a little bit of depth on the edge of a wall, but we, we don't have any depth on the wall itself, the wall color will be very similar. So we can propagate that depth onto the wall. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good and it's very fast. And so that's basically what our system does. And so you can look here, this is an example from a paper showing um, using this ultra coarse depth input and using this image on the left, they're able to use bilateral filtering to upsample and enhance the depth um, to have a plausible and in general more accurate um, depth map. And we basically do that um, in our system as well. Um, so uh, one of the things, Jeff, I want to emphasize here is that, you know, with deep learning and everything, uh, deep learning being the you know dominant technique uh, these days for a lot of problems, people forget that when you're building a product, you need a combination of these skills, right? You can't just be you no know, deep learning and uh, be able to build a product. You need to know a lot of traditional computer vision techniques as well, so that they augment your skill, right? The the curve that you had shown, the little details there, right? You make small changes which lead to big impact happens only when you have this broad set of tools, not just a single hammer uh, with which you, you know, hit everything. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and even in deep learning, a lot of the innovation in 3D deep learning comes from integrating some traditional knowledge about geometry and, you know, appearance and all these different, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know ray tracing and you know, uh, implicit surfaces and 
all these new new things are 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 inspired by uh, geometric understanding and prior intuition. So to to succeed, you you need to do both. And and also, yeah, for a real product, you often can't run uh, you know deep learning in in production, uh, at least for for many tasks, you you can't afford to because you can't run it fast enough. And so you need to be clever. Maybe you can run it um, periodically. Maybe you can run it on alternating frames, but often you can't run it on every frame. So right. you have to figure out clever tricks like this bilateral filtering. Um, so a little quick video demo of our view synthesis. So on the left, you can see our slam running. And on the right, you can see the synthesized uh, left-right views um, being sent to the user. And it's a little hard to tell, but the left and right camera views are not identical. And when you have the headset on, you you feel that things are are actually at the correct depth. Um, actually feels right to you. Whereas if we didn't, if we don't do this correction, everything just feels wrong. So, yeah, that's our view synthesis, which is now shipped as RimView 3D. Uh, we haven't shipped any big updates to it in the last year, but stay tuned. We have um, people in the audience that have uh, index headsets can try that out in the options menu. Yes. And you know, I actually I wonder if I had cut this video a little bit short because there is a part that I thought is really cool. Let me replay it again. Um, I think towards the end of this clip, we we switch to like an edge detect mode where we render the edges instead of the camera view and you can actually blend the VR and AR together, or VR and real world together. It's really cool. Uh, wait for that. I could be wrong that we don't actually do it in this video. Okay, here we go. Cool, yeah, so check this out. So, so here we're actually fusing the two, and if you look carefully, you can see that basically everything's moving in unison. Really looks, it really feels like the desk is glued inside of your VR scene, which is really cool. Nice. Um, so the next topic that we work on for obvious reasons on a VR headset is tracking. And the problem here is that methods that use external tracking, like base stations, for example, uh, have the problem of you have to set them up. Um, they're, uh, they're more difficult to, to carry from place to place. So you can't just take your headset somewhere and show somebody. You have to really set up the environment. They're more costly. And just all these things together basically hinder adoption. Um, and on top of that, if you don't have cameras or camera processing, you also can't do some smart things like understand the room um, and uh, you know do automatic room setup. Again, here's a, a screenshot from from Oculus showing showing this off on their on their Quest system. Um, but you know, slam tracking gives you lower cost. You don't have to have the base stations. Uh, the room setup can be almost instantaneous. Um, it can detect the floor. It can figure out the obstacles, um, and uh, and you can also start to play with AR experiences inside of VR, which is a nice bridge to the future. Um, so that's why slam tracking makes sense. Um, how we do it at Arcturus is fairly unique. We we combine together a camera. It's a it's a visual inertial system. We're combining camera data and IMU data uh, at, at every frame. And we're even using IMU data in the future, even, even newer than the last frame. We fuse that all together. We, um, we do a, we reconstruct not only points, which uh, people are somewhat familiar with, we also reconstruct lines in the scene. Uh, that'll help us reduce accuracy. It also helps us, or improve accuracy. It also helps us provide us with a better, uh, conceptual view of the obstacles around you. Lots of times little point clouds are hard to correlate to the real world, but line reconstruction is much easier. Um, and our system is really fast. It's tuned to have a front end part that's extremely quick, and then a back end part that's optimizing the entire map of the scene um, around you. So I'll just show a couple of clips of that. 
So here we are um, mapping the scene, or we're just kind of moving around a relatively gentle, and you can see as we move, the map gets built. So that's how the system maps. And now I'll show you a little bit more aggressive motion. So here we're playing with this virtual dog, and you can see our head rotations are pretty quick here. Playing fetch. Uh, we're also robust to you blinding the left and right uh, camera. So uh, we, it's a stereo slam system. So if, if you're blinding one camera, we can still track with the other camera. So here we're blinding one camera, but tracking is unaffected. And then just to push it uh, here, you can see some really aggressive motions playing Space Pirate Trainer. Actually, no, ping whatever this game is inside the lab. Um, and you can see it's robust to pretty crazy motion. Even frames that are basically untrackable with the camera, we can still maintain track with IMU data. Wow. Yeah, if, if anybody has wow. out there has uh, tried this on the uh, in Valve's uh, the lab, you know that this is, they basically pushed the action as far as you can push it without just physically making people sick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are uh, pretty, uh, you know, close to oh, the end of. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, go ahead. Actually, uh, sorry. Yeah. So, should we can, can we go a couple minutes over, or should we basically wrap up now? Uh, no. Uh, let's let's go a couple of minutes over. Um, okay. I I think we can. Okay. Do you have the question ready, Phil? I just want to make sure that people get their yeah. you know chance at the goodies, and then we will go yeah. a couple of minutes over. Yeah, definitely. People, so let's. People who miss out can still watch the YouTube uh, recording, right? Great. Totally makes sense. So we'll, I'll do the trivia question here, and then we can get back to um, the, the rest here. Um, so uh, for people that are here for the first time, the way this works is that I'm going to ask a question based on the slides uh, from Jeff's presentation. The first person to answer correctly in the Zoom chat here on my screen, whether you send it to me or the room or just presenters or whatever, it doesn't actually matter. Whoever answers first will win. Satya, would you like to tell them what they'll win? Yeah, they will win uh, our course, Deep Learning with PyTorch. And as a reminder, the Indiegogo campaign for the new OpenCV courses uh, ends on Friday. So head on over to Indiegogo and lock in the tremendous savings there. So um, <clears throat> the trivia question is, the former head of business development at Red Laser, Tony Zhu, went on to found what food delivery startup? All right, here come the answers. I see, looks like Priyesh, Priyesh Sharma is our first answer here. Congratulations, Priyesh. We will uh, be in touch after the show to uh, hook you up with your free Deep Learning with PyTorch courses. That's great. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, uh, thanks Phil. Uh, Jeff, uh, take us home, I mean, with uh, yeah. the remaining slides. I'll keep it quick. Sorry, uh, we we had so much content, I over-indexed. Yeah, it's, it's it all good. It's been, it's been fun. If there's, if there's, I still have time for questions if anybody else does at the end. Um, otherwise, really quickly, uh, the last piece that we've been working on recently at Arcturus is controller tracking. You can actually follow us on Twitter if you want to see progress. We're actually posting a lot of this live as we go. Um, but um, I won't motivate this too much, but basically you need input and, um, and we need to be able to do it from the headset. So you don't, again, you don't need base stations. So our, our project has been purely virtual. We decided to actually simulate the controllers um, in a special way, not actually building physical controllers at first. This allows us to basically tweak the algorithms, tweak the hardware virtually as we go. Um, it just allows us to iterate extremely fast. So we modeled the controllers in Blender. We actually chose to render them in SceneKit because we have familiarity with it. You could use another engine. Um, in SceneKit, we're able to live render uh, these controllers with whatever orientation, whatever position you want. Um, and it's totally in real time, so we don't have any offline rendering required. Uh, we can, you know, doing that though is somewhat robotic. You need a more natural motion. So 
we actually have the ability to record uh, and replay a real trajectory. So here you can see we're recording controller motion and actually head motion um, from real controllers. We play back in this real-time interface. You can see just how much more natural it looks. We can control the lighting in real time. We can make the controllers flash however we want. Um, uh, we just learned a lot about building these kind of systems in the past. We wanted to make this one fully real time. Um, one of the cooler things that I haven't shown before today is what do you do when you want to have, you want to simulate really wide field cameras? Um, here we're actually showing that we can simulate fisheye cameras, but as we go to a really wide FOV, we're using a traditional, you know, pinhole rendering engine and you see what happens. Like, at 180 degrees, the pinhole projection breaks. You can't do it. And so basically, you get these extremely blurred images. Um, and that's just not usable. And so to fix that, we actually are rendering, instead of one view, we're actually rendering a triangular prism. We could also render a cube all around you, but we're rendering into a prism because we only need four views instead of six. Um, and so we automatically, uh, here we can see we automatically switch from uh, traditional single view pinhole to uh, multi-view triangular prism um, rendering. And so this allows us to render, uh, again, in real time, up to um, up to 180 degree field of view. Wow, that's a big difference. Wow. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about how our system works. We, we, detect, um, we detect blobs, um, really just like OpenCV blob detection. But the problem is we don't know um, which blobs correspond to which LEDs on our virtual controller. And if you were to just randomly permute that and try to do that association, you come up with something like 20 million possible uh, associations from for blob to, to LED pairs. And that's just not solvable. So we make the assumption that Blobs that you find that are close in 2D are probably also close in 3D, and we reject candidates that are not close in 3D. That gets us down to 20,000 uh, associations, and with some really smart uh, solving, we can actually do that in real time. And so that actually allows us to bootstrap our controller poses in real time, and you're seeing the raw output of the vision-only bootstrapping here. Um, there's multiple solutions. We're only using three points for the solve, and there are these degenerate um, and right. so these these these, in, these uh, reflections and things like that. Um, one of these is correct though, and um, and so where we're going from here is actually integrating IMU information, and we actually haven't shown this really yet either. I'll give you guys a little peek though. Here we're fusing simulated IMU data with the camera data that you just saw, and we're able to go from that flickery, um, you know, bootstrapping to a fully tracked controller. Right. And uh, way smoother um, and uh, more accurate. And then, and then the final peak is, uh, we probably won't be showing this off for a few weeks, but we can even do it with multi-control. Oh, sweet. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, that's the tech I wanted to show folks. Um, also, Arcturus is hiring if people are, are interested, but yeah. That's great. So where can people reach you, uh, the people who may be looking for a job? They can reach me at jeff at arcturus.industries, or they can tweet at me at JR Powers. That's great. Um, so that's uh, that's about it. Thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for this amazing presentation. I really loved your stories, and I'm amazed by what you're doing at Ar Arturus Industries now. Um, amazing stuff, really amazing stuff, and thanks for being here. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. I'm sad I went too slow to have time for questions, so if anybody does have follow-up questions, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We'll just have to have you back on again, I guess. Just do a full hour of questions. <laughs> That's great. I really appreciate the opportunity to join. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thanks, Phil. Yeah, thanks, everybody. We'll see you again next Thursday, 9 a.m. sharp. Okay, bye. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. 
This week's episode was brought to you by OpenCV Courses. Visit opencv.org courses to learn from the experts. 